To begin, let us acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on traditional Nishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. We thank the Indigenous peoples of this area for their care of this land for thousands of years, and we hope to honor and respect them as we hold our virtual event today. I'd also like to take a moment to personally thank everyone for attending today's presentation. Our speakers this afternoon are Dr. Rachel Wombold and Dr. Nancy Wang, who will be co-presenting on the topic, Long-Term Outcomes of Lyme Carditis, an update for 2022. Dr. Wombold is a cardiology fellow from Queen's University. She completed her medical training at Norwich Medical School in the United Kingdom, followed by her internal medicine residency at Queen's University. Her interests include clinical cardiology, Lyme carditis, and women's cardiovascular wellness. Dr. Wang is an internal medical resident and Master of Epidemiology candidate at Queen's University through the Clinical Investigator Program. Her current thesis focuses on determining patient and provider factors associated with long-term outcomes in patients with implantable cardioverter defibrillators. Dr. Wang's other clinical interests include Lyme carditis, pacemakers, and women's health. Dr. Wang is passionate about cardiovascular medicine and health services research. We will have Dr. Wombold and Dr. Wang co-present, and then we will open from questions from the audience. You can ask your questions by either entering your questions into the chat box, you can raise your hand using the icon, or if time allows, you can unmute and ask your questions directly. Please help us welcome Dr. Wombold and Dr. Wang to the podium. We can see your presentation okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, everything sounds clear. Thanks, Veronica. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. Rachel and I are very excited to share some of the uh, research from our lab about the long-term outcomes of Lyme carditis. Um, our supervisor for these um, set of projects is Dr. Berenchuk, who I see is also in uh, the call today. Uh, to start, uh, we have no conflicts of interest to report for this presentation. So the goal of this presentation is to re review the most recent research coming out of our lab on the topic of long-term follow-up for patients with Lyme carditis. The diagnostic assessment and treatment of patients with Lyme carditis has been covered extensively in recent talks, so we've uh, decided to focus more on uh, the long-term aspect, and we'll discuss this only briefly. We will review our recent case series, which reports on the topic of pacemaker explantation following the treatment of Lyme. We'll then discuss the topic of Lyme-associated dilated cardiomyopathy, followed by our analysis of patients with Lyme carditis after a year of follow-up. Finally, we would just like to provide a quick reflection on what it has mean to, uh, meant to be a young researcher in the field of uh, Lyme carditis. Um, so to start, I'll just begin with some epidemiology about Lyme. Lyme disease is a spirochetal infection caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. And while there's many different species of ticks in Canada and the United States, it's primarily the black-like ticks, otherwise known as the deer ticks, that carry the infection that cause Lyme disease. In order for the infection to be transmitted, ticks are typically attached to their human hosts for about 36 to 48 hours. We know that 95% of Lyme disease cases are reported between April and November, with the peak onset occurring during the summer months when the tick vectors are active and when Canadians spend the most time outdoors. Here I've shown a map of the Lyme disease risk areas in Ontario. You can see that the Kingston and surrounding area here is considered to be a Lyme endemic region. And this is where our center is located. This map shows the established populations of the Ixoides scapularis in red and the estimated distribution of the areas where it can survive and reproduce in yellow. And you can see that the distribution is largely along the west coast in the states. Here is a similar map for Ixoides pacificus or the western black lake tick, which you can see is another carrier for Lyme disease and lies mostly along the west coast. The incidence of Lyme disease continues to rise in recent years in Canada, and here I've listed the number of cases. As you can see, by preliminary numbers, the cases in 2021 have reached a high of 28,000 so far. 
Um, now I'd like to talk to you briefly about the stages of uh, Lyme disease that is, has been identified in literature. Um, there's three major stages. The first stage is the early localized disease, which generally occurs days to weeks after infection and is characterized by erythema migrans, which we typically recognize as a classic bullseye pattern, but can actually appear as different rashes as well. Um, patients often present with symptoms uh, such as fever, fatigue, malaise, and lethargy. The early disseminated um, disease, which is the second stage, occurs typically weeks to months after an infection and is characterized by multiple erythema migrans or lesions, as well as other neurologic and cardiac symptoms. And finally, the late disseminated disease usually occurs months to years after infection and is characterized by intermittent or persistent arthritis and neurologic problems. Today, we're going to be focusing mostly on the early disseminated phase in more detail, as this is typically when we see um, cardiac symptoms occur. Lyme carditis, which is the focus of our talk today, is a term that's used to describe cardiac manifestations associated with Lyme disease. It's caused by a direct invasion of spare sheets into the layer of heart tissues and can affect all parts of the heart, including the conduction system, that's kind of the electrical activity, the cardiac membranes, the cardiac muscles, the blood vessels, and even the valves. It's um, Lyme carditis is generally more common in males than females with a ratio of approximately three to one. AV conduction blockade is the most common electrophysiologic abnormality found with Lyme carditis. AV conduction blocks are significant because they affect the normal passage of electric activity from the atria to the ventricles, and it can progress rapidly from what's called a first degree heart block to a third degree heart block, also called a complete heart block. Less commonly are other electrophysical physiologic abnormalities include things like atrial fibrillation, supraventricular tachycardia and ventricular tachycardias, as well as blocks affecting the conduction system below the level of the AV node. And this can be associated with symptoms including syncope, lightheadedness or dizziness, shortness of breath, palpitations or chest pain. We know that Lyme carditis is relatively uncommon. It occurs usually as a complication of Lyme disease in only about 4 to 10% of untreated patients, and only 1% of Lyme carditis will develop AV blockade. Um, in addition to the abnormalities of the conduction system, we also know that Lyme carditis can manifest as myocarditis, pericarditis, and even cardiomyopathy. The good news is that Lyme carditis is usually completely reversible with early antibiotic treatment. Our lab has published a number of papers highlighting important uh, associations between Lyme carditis and atrial ventricular block. Uh, in 2018, we published in the Canadian Medical Association a paper on the five practical things to know about Lyme carditis. Number one is that Lyme carditis can be an early manifestation of Lyme disease, so it's important to keep this in mind and perform an ECG in patients suspected of Lyme disease. Number two is that Lyme carditis should be considered in younger patients with severe conduction abnormalities, as these are often patients with the highest risk factors for contracting Lyme. Number three is that atrial ventricular block in Lyme carditis can progress rapidly and be fatal. So it's very important not only to think about Lyme carditis, but also to initiate treatment. Early treatment of uh, Lyme carditis with antibiotics may prevent irreversible conduction disease due to chronic inflammation in Lyme carditis. I'll show you an algorithm and treatment protocol which we have subsequently developed from our lab. And finally, before consideration of permanent pacemakers, um, clinicians should really wait for a response to antibiotic treatment as most atrial ventricular flocks secondary to Lyme carditis will improve with treatment. In this paper, also published in 2018, we were able to highlight our experience with temporary permanent pacemakers. This is where an endocardial lead is implanted and connected with an external pacemaker. We found that temporary permanent pacemakers are an efficient way to manage symptomatic heart block as it allows for increased mobility instead of the classic bed rest that would be required with standard temporary pacemakers. Patients with Lyme carditis are often young and otherwise healthy, and the er increased mobilization early may prevent deconditioning in hospital. For this case, Dr. Baranchuk, who is our supervisor, implanted the temporary permanent pacemaker was at, and was actually able to watch the patient walk from the implantation table to the bed immediately after the procedure. This was very rewarding. <laughs> 
So how do we know when heart block may be due to Lyme carditis? In order to help determine how likely a patient presenting with heart block may have underlying Lyme disease, our research group developed the SILK score or the Suspiciousness Index in Lyme carditis score using the acronym of COSTAR. Essentially, we assess the presence of symptoms as well as other risk factors for Lyme disease, such as sex, age, outdoor activity, tick bite, and rash to determine the suspiciousness index. The final score then stratifies the patients into those at low, intermediate, or high risk of developing Lyme carditis. This score was subsequently proposed as part of an algorithm which we published in JAK, outlining the diagnosis and treatment of Lyme carditis. I'll just briefly, briefly walk you through the steps of this algorithm, and then later on in the presentation, Rachel will uh, present some modifications to this algorithm that we have since determined. When patients first present with high degree AV block, as I mentioned, it's important to consider Lyme carditis using the SILK score. If a patient has a score of three or higher, they're in the intermediate to high risk for Lyme disease and serologic tests as well as empiric IV antibiotics should be started. If the patient is bradycardic with a slow heart rate, they should have cardiac monitoring plus or minus a temporary permanent pacemaker if they're symptomatic or have high risk ECG features. If there's serologic confirmation of Lyme disease, IV antibiotics should be continued for 10 to 14 days, followed by oral antibiotics for a total course of about 14 to 21 days. After around two weeks, patients with one-to-one -one conduction should be evaluated using a stress test. The treadmill stress test evaluates AV nodal stability with exercise. If we are able to conduct or if they are able to conduct at a rate of one to one with a heart rate of greater than 120 beats per minute, then we can just follow these patients up. If they have a heart rate of 90 to 120, then they need to have a repeat stress test. If their heart rate is less than, one, uh, less than 90 and they start having conduction abnormalities, then these patients need a permanent pacemaker. It's important to know that in our 14 patient series so far in our center, no one fell into the categories of the 90 to 120 or the less than 90. So in fact, all patients improved their conduction with appropriate antibiotic management. The work from our lab was featured as a review topic of the week on Lyme carditis in Jack. This central illustration, I feel really nicely highlights the aspects of care of patients with Lyme carditis. So as you can see, Lyme disease um, patients usually present one to two months after initial tick exposure, and 80 to 90% of Lyme carditis will present with high degree AV block. It's important to emphasize that these patients often seek medical care multiple times before the correct diagnosis is made <clears throat> due to the diversity of the case presentations, as well as the nonspecific symptoms. This is a reflection that increased recognition of Lyme carditis is needed especially in the endemic regions such as Kingston and area. Finally, since most AV block resolves with appropriate IV antibiotics, permanent pacemaker implantation is generally not necessary. And now I'll pass it over to Rachel. Thanks, Nancy. So we are excited to present our latest case series, which will be published in Jack Case Reports tomorrow, in fact. In this case series, we outline the cases of two patients who had successful pacemaker explantation following the treatment of their Lyme carditis. As Nancy just discussed, permanent pacemakers for the treatment of high degree AV block associated with Lyme carditis are rarely required as a majority of patients completely recover following the administration of appropriate guideline directed antibiotics. As you can see, both patients here in our case series were middle-aged with no previous history of cardiac disease. Case one presented with dizziness and shortness of breath, as well as a remote history of a non-specific rash three months prior. She was found to have complete heart block at that time. We calculated her SILK score uh, and it came out to be eight, which puts her at a high risk for Lyme carditis. Case two presented with dizziness and two episodes of non-prodromal syncope, meaning that he didn't have any symptoms before he lost consciousness. His ECG showed slow atrial fibrillation with pauses lasting up to 10 seconds in duration. We calculated his SILK score as a four, which puts him in the intermediate risk category. 
Both of these patients were treated with antibiotics. However, you should note uh, that this is not in keeping with the IDSA guidelines, which recommends intravenous ceftriaxone for hospitalized patients and oral amoxicillin or doxycycline in the outpatient setting for a 14 to 21 day course. <clears throat> At our facility, we typically treat our, our inpatients with Lyme carditis with ceftriaxone two grams IV, um, as long as they don't have any allergies, of course. Uh, and we will keep them on the intravenous ceftriaxone until they leave hospital, at which time we put them on the doxycycline for a total of 21 days. Nancy has kindly reviewed our previously published algorithm detailing the management of patients diagnosed with conduction abnormalities. This paper was an opportunity to take the, the algorithm that was previously developed one step further and to outline how we might manage patients on follow-up who have unfortunately undergone a permanent pacemaker implantation during their course in hospital. We'll review this algorithm in a little bit more detail uh, shortly. So next slide, please. Yeah. To get back to the case, uh, we first met these patients on follow-up in our cardiac rhythm and device clinic for routine pacemaker interrogations. They had initially received their pacemakers and treatment at peripheral hospitals. Both patients were found to be in normal sinus rhythm on their follow-up ECG with no evidence of conduction delays. On pacemaker interrogation, neither of the patients showed any evidence of ventricular pacing. So to ensure that it was safe to proceed with a pacemaker explantation, our patients underwent treadmill stress testing to ensure that they were able to keep one-to-one -one conduction at a higher heart rate. Both of these patients were successful at mounting an appropriate heart rate in response to exercise while maintaining their one-to-one -one conduction. Which is good. <laughs> So why does this matter? Um, to echo our message from before, permanent pacemakers are rarely required in the treatment of Lyme carditis. Temporary pacing is an option, either with the transvenous approach through the neck or through the insertion of a temporary permanent device. As Nancy mentioned, the temporary permanent device has the major advantage that patients are able to walk around. And this is important in hospitals so that we can prevent major complications such as DVTs or infections. This also means that healthcare providers must, must, must suspect Lyme carditis and anybody that has risk factors for the disease, especially those that live in endemic regions. Within the first year of inserting a permanent pacemaker, transvenous lead extraction and pacemaker explantation has a very high success rate with low rates of complications. The removal of a recently placed lead can usually just be achieved by direct traction and most facilities should be able to facilitate that. However, chronically implanted devices, they often develop fibrotic lead attachments on the tip and throughout the length of the wire. And these attachments can be to veins and as well as the endocardial structures. So it increases the risks of complications when you go to remove the lead. So there's only certain hospitals within the, the province that is able to do this sort of procedure. So this highlights again the importance of close follow-up, early follow-up for these patients, so that early pacemaker explantation can be arranged if it's clinically indicated. So this is the algorithm. Um, we wanted to encourage a systematic approach to pacemaker explantation to ensure that there's adequate patient safety. Our practice is to admit patients as, um, on intravenous antibiotics in hospital uh, until a one-to-one -one AV node conduction has recovered. Once there's AV nodal recovery, they undergo a pre-discharge stress test uh, to assess their stability, and then they're discharged home on oral antibiotics as we have discussed in the previous algorithm. If a permanent pacemaker was inserted prior to the confirmation of Lyme carditis, which occasionally happens if people do forget to send serology, pacemaker explantation is possible. Pacemaker interrogation should occur after the patient has finished their complete antibiotic regimen. If there's no ventricular pacing, so the patient's not dependent on their pacemaker any longer, the patient should undergo a stress test to ensure that their AV node is functioning properly. If the patient can maintain that one-to-one -one AV node conduction at a heart, higher heart rate above 120, then the pacemaker can be explanted safely. 
If they're unable to maintain this one-to-one -one conduction over 120 beats per minute, then we encourage uh, providers to repeat the stress test to give them another chance. Um, for patients with ongoing ventricular pacing, when you interrogate them, we um, include in this algorithm that this reinterrogation should occur again in four to six months. This just allows more time for the inflammation within the conduction system to hopefully settle down for these patients. Um, a permanent pacemaker should remain in place as long as the patient is still requiring it for ventricular pacing. And just to wrap up this case series, um, I just wanted to show you the ECGs uh, throughout our follow-up with this patient. So at the top, you can see her presenting ECG. And what you see is that she is in complete heart block. So you can see the very tiny little waves. Those are called P waves. And there's not always a QRS complex following uh, those little P waves. So that means that she was in complete heart block. On follow-up after three months, so at this time she had completed her antibiotics, you could see here that she is in one-to-one -one conduction. So for every little P wave, there is a QRS complex that follows, uh, and that would be a normal rhythm. And then finally, the last ECG here is when we had her on the treadmill performing her stress test. And again, she's able to mount a good response to exercise, so her heart rate's going at about 150 beats per minute, and she remains in that one-to-one -one conduction, which is great. So we've known for some time that permanent pacemakers are generally, generally not required for patients presenting with Lyme carditis. This table here has been extracted from a paper published out of our lab back in 2018, showing uh, the resolution of high degree AV block in five patients within 10 days of starting antibiotics. So we know that antibiotics work really, really well and no permanent pacemaker uh, is required. I just wanted to touch briefly on the second part of our case series that I, I just went through. We were able to send the extracted pacemaker lead tips for Borrelia DNA testing using quantitative PCR amplification. Previous research has shown that myocardial biopsy specimens in patients with Lyme carditis have demonstrated transmural inflammation and characteristic band-like endocardial lymphocyte infiltration, which you can see in uh, the top image on the right. Occasionally, you can also visualize some of the spiral sheets, which you can see at the bottom there. In our study, the negative quantitative PCR amplification for Borrelia on the extracted pacemaker leads may suggest complete resolution of the infection and a greater likelihood of successful pacemaker explantation long-term. However, it is also possible that the Borrelia uh, infiltration in our patient was more concentrated in the conduction system rather than the myocardium where the lead tips would have been secured. This is possible because uh, previous immunofluorescence studies that have been done in mouse models inoculated with Lyme um, have shown that Borrelia in the AV ju junction and epicardium were more common than uh, infiltration in the myocardium. So as of right now, the utility of Borrelia testing on the myocardial tissue from extracted leads remains un unknown. Um, and just an aside, those images were taken from the CDC website. They weren't actually from our patient. Um, so the next study that uh, we wanted to discuss is currently under review for publication. Um, this was an exciting collaboration between our lab at Queen's University with labs at the Mayo Clinic and John Hopkins University. So this project was a systematic review and meta-analysis exploring the association between late disseminated Lyme disease and dilated cardiomyopathy. Borrelia was first isolated in the myocardium back in 1991. Since that time, there has been increased recognition that untreated or poorly treated Lyme carditis could be associated with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. However, despite the fact that there is this growing recognition, the link between late disseminated Lyme disease and the development of dilated cardiomyopathy remains quite controversial. So for the purpose of this systematic review, we included studies that evaluated the association between Lyme and dilated cardiomyopathy in humans. Dilated cardiomyopathy uh, was defined as a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 40% and or endomyocardial biopsy that was consistent with dilated cardiomyopathy. Initially, we were able to identify 439 studies. However, uh, we ultimately included only 11 in our analysis. 
Seven of these studies reported evidence of an association between Borrelia infection and dilated cardiomyopathy development. A study by Klein and al. examined the prevalence of anti antibodies to Borrelia in 42 patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. On ELISA, there was a 26% seropositivity rate. Another study by Geyser and al. reported seropositivity to Borrelia antibodies in 11 out of 46 patients, so 24%, for those with dilated cardiomyopathy and who had a history of clinical features that were consistent with Lyme infection. Most recent studies have been using PCR analysis of endomyocardial biopsy specimens to identify patients uh, with dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, a study by Palasek and all noted that eight out of 39 patients, so 21% with dilated cardiomyopathy, were found to have Borrelia genome on PCR or electron microscopy analysis of the, the biopsy samples. Four studies did not show any association between dilated cardiomyopathy and Borrelia infection. However, they lacked myocardial biopsy analysis, and they were relying mostly on serology, which has questionable sensitivity for patients presenting in the later stages of their disease. So of the studies included in this analysis, six of the 11 included details on the administration of antibiotics to patients with suspected Borrelia-induced dilated cardiomyopathy. The most commonly administered uh, antibiotic was ceftriaxone at a dose of two grams per day uh, for 14 to 21 days. 67% of the studies identified evidence of improved cardiac function, functional status, or reversal of pathological cardiac remodeling in response to those antibiotics. Gazer and all demonstrated either complete normalization or significant improvement in left ventricular function in 82% of dilated cardiomyopathy patients, seropositive for Borrelia, after a two-week course of cetraxone. Palisic and all noted significant improvement in echo features of cardiomyopathy and functional status in eight patients with Borrelia detected on biopsy. And similarly, uh, Kunichka uh, also noted improvements in left ventricular morphology, cardiac function, and status in 22 patients recently diagnosed, diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy and Borrelia genome detected on PCR. The real incidence of dilated cardiomyopathy in late disseminated Lyme disease may be underreported due to a lack of long-term follow-up studies on patients with Lyme carditis. It's therefore imperative to conduct additional longitudinal studies to determine whether Borrelia is causative for dilated cardiomyopathy, as well as randomized control trials to determine uh, whether antibiotics would improve clinical function. I think these studies also show the importance of early antibiotic administration. If allowed to reach the chronic stages, changes in the myocardium may become irreversible at that time because of fibrosis and myocardial necrosis that develops with the chronic inflammation. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, as uh, Rachel just briefly mentioned, because the long-term outcomes of patients with serologically confirmed Lyme carditis is really not known, we developed a small observational study of patients confirmed with Lyme carditis at our center. So in this case series, we included seven patients with a mean follow-up of around 21 months. Of our seven patients, um, six of them were male. And the median silk score, as we briefly talked about previously, was 7.0. As you would recall, a score of 7 to 12 is considered high risk for Lyme carditis. During hospitalization, these two patients uh, required uh, temporary permanent pacers, and two had an abnormal echocardiogram uh, during the admission. There was one patient who had some evidence of diastolic dysfunction. The median time to resolution of conduction abnormalities is approximately three days. And as I mentioned, in the mean follow-up was about 21 months, at which time all patients were asymptomatic and had resumed their usual physical activity at follow-up. At this time, the median heart rate was 49, the PR interval was 150, and the QRS interval was 92. I just briefly wanted to show you some of the ECGs of the progressions of each of these patients. And as you can see, at admission, a lot of these patients had advanced heart block. And then at discharge, this had largely con um, con uh, converted into sinus rhythm. 
though some still had a first degree heart block with a prolonged PR interval. At the long-term follow-up of greater than 12 months, all the patients were asymptomatic and had resumed normal sinus rhythm without any evidence of PR prolongation. So we just thought it would be uh, nice to kind of provide some reflections uh, on what it has meant to us to be researchers uh, in this field. So for myself, attending medical school uh, in England, Lyme disease, let alone Lyme carditis, was not something that was readily covered in our lectures. Um, but when I moved to Kingston, which we know is endemic for Lyme, I was actually blown away by the number of individuals that would come through our wards affected by this disease. And what stood out to me the most is that often these were young individuals. We saw lots of working men who had young families, and it reminded me a lot of my own family at home. Um, I found it really challenging um, to speak to their, their loved ones, their, their wives, their partners that, uh, about the diagnosis and the plan that we would have to put in a temporary pacemaker um, because the electrical system in their heart wasn't functioning. So obviously that would be terrifying for anybody. These patients, they often stay on our wards for a week at least. Um, and during that time, you really do start to develop a relationship with them and their families um, because they are a lot like you. Um, I myself am a mother of three and we spend a lot of out a lot of time outdoors. We go for a lot of hikes and we play in the park. Um, and in fact, our own dog, Athena, who is a little black minpin, she has been diagnosed and treated with Lyme disease. So this has affected our little family as well. Um, we've made it a priority to make our children very aware of Lyme. Um, we call them the naughty bugs. And so I'm often telling my children to get out of, the, out of the long grass and we get home and we check our bodies for ticks. So getting involved with Lyme research has been extremely rewarding because I know it does make a huge difference to many people. Um, but research alone isn't going to stop the infection. We need to continue to promote prevention at the population level. Level. We need to raise awareness through education and outreach. We need to focus on educating healthcare providers on how to recognize and treat Lyme disease and fight for policies that are going to help combat uh, climate change. Um, we strongly feel that no infection should ever go untreated. So we'd like to thank you all for attending our talk and thank you kindly for inviting us to speak to you today. Um, it would be our pleasure to take any questions that uh, you might have at this time. Thank you, Dr. Wombolt and Dr. Wang for your uh, enlightening presentation. I'm gonna go to the chat box. I see a couple questions and some comments of people's questions. So we'll start with the first in the chat. Lyme is a clinical disease and serology for Lyme is notoriously flawed. A positive test along with a comprehensive risk assessment and history taking. The present testing misses one third of those that truly do have the disease. Wouldn't it be more prudent to empirically start antibiotic therapy rather than wait for the test? I'm assuming the test results to come in. Doesn't this move the test to the top of the hierarchy and discount clinical judgment? Well, thank you very much uh, for that comment. Um, commonly what happens is we do base the majority of our judgment um, on our uh, comprehensive risk assessment, as you said, and the history. Um, not always do we get that history of the tick bite or the erythema migraines rash, but um, that is why the SILK score that um, Nancy described is so valuable because it does take those high risk characteristics and kind of gives us a score uh, on what that individual's risk is. I think for us, if we see a young person, and I mean young, like less than 60, let's say, um, presenting to our hospital with a, a conduction abnormality, um, even if they haven't had, as I said, a tick bite or uh, that, that rash, we do start antibiotics empirically because this is something that we don't want to miss. Um, the Lyme serology, when we send it, it can take up to a week to get back. And sometimes, as you mentioned, um, it does miss those cases. And, and we we have resent um, the, the tests again, just to be sure if we were um, had a high suspicion for the infection. So yes, we, we do start antibiotics empirically uh, for these individuals. 
Thank you. We do have some information sharing going on. So I'm just going to read. There are two comments provided and then allow you an opportunity to add any additional information because I think the two comments and information share and relate to this, the first question. Uh, to my knowledge and experience, and according to literature, Lyme is not a clinical disease only, and tests are very useful to distinguish Lyme from other conditions which can present in similar ways. Present testing misses two-thirds of early disease because of inadequate production of antibodies in early phases, thus testing is not useful in early disease, but this is not the case in late disease such as Lyme carditis, where serology is actually very reliable. And the additional comment was, according, again, different people, according to all literature, Lyme is a clinical disease, but doctors are no longer taught how to diagnose clinically. Physicians will study the test rather than listen to the patient. 91% of symptoms can't be measured. So again, I think this there's just some good information sharing. Um, any additional comments you would like to add? Because I think it relates to that first question. No, I think those are, you know, those are great comments. Um, at the end of the day, you know, uh, Rob is right there. You know, we do have to rely on our clinical judgment and you have to take the patient's word for their symptoms and their exposures. Um, and we can't rely on these tests. They take far too long to come back. Um, so yeah, definitely have to take the patient at their word for those things. Thank you. Um, a next question I see in the chat box is, is there a role for steroid treatment in Lyme carditis? I can try to answer this one. Um, as far as we know to date, and we definitely don't know everything, um, I believe there is not a role for steroid treatment in Lyme carditis at this time. That being said, um, in, in cases especially of uh, myocarditis or pericarditis, sometimes steroids do have a role. And so potentially, because this is such a, a poorly studied um, um, disease, potentially in the future, as we continue to conduct research, um, steroids might become uh, part of the treatment of Lyme carditis. I don't know if Rachel or Dr. Baranchuk have anything to add for this. No, I think Nancy is, uh, you know, right, right on with that. Um, the other thing that we've seen is that the the administration of the antibiotics, the ceftriaxone especially, not only acts as, you know, an antibiotic to treat the infection, but we do believe that there is an anti-inflammatory role of that specific anti uh, antibiotic, and so, um, you know, it it does the job quite nicely for Lyme carditis when when it's an acute presentation. Thank you. So that is what I have right now. Oh, wait a minute. We have another chat. I was just going to say I was going to open it up, but okay. So uh, S1E7, Dr. Ralph Hawkins explains the challenges of detecting Lyme disease through testing. Looking at Lyme, it's on the Can Lyme website. I believe there's an article. You are still only going to pick up only two thirds of the patients who likely have Lyme disease with the new testing system that uses to ELISA test. Any comments to that uh, information sharing? Am I able to make a comment, a brief comment? Absolutely, Dr. Baranchuk. All right, well, for, first of all, congratulations to Rachel and Nancy. It makes me so proud to listen uh, to you articulating presentations at such a high level. I'm sorry to the audience, I'm biased because I work with these two amazing doctors and uh, makes me really very proud. Um, uh, in, in response to Rob's comments, I think uh, Rob, that the distinction here is we're talking about Lyme carditis and the role of serology in the diagnosis of Lyme carditis, not in the diagnosis of Lyme disease which all your comments are supported by evidence-based. This is not the topic today. The topic is Lyme carditis. And both doctors mentioned on how the algorithms were articulated to use the information of the serology to arrive to the diagnosis of Lyme carditis, I insist. Why is that? Because the manifestations in nine to 10 patients of Lyme carditis are in common with other way more prevalent diseases than Lyme disease. For example, coronary artery disease, a true pandemic around the world. That is when you have cardiovascular disease, 
you may manifest with shutdown of your electrical system and complete AV block. So the efforts here are directed to recognize those AV blocks that are due to Lyme disease, because if you use antibiotic, you may avoid implanting a pacemaker. This is the essence. So my suggestion is not to bring this topic, which is fascinating, and you are absolutely correct, on the limitations of serology for the diagnosis of Lyme disease, and to concentrate in the educational value of learning how we integrate serology for the diagnosis of Lyme carditis. Thank you, and again, congratulations to Rachel and Nancy. Spectacular presentation. Thank you, Dr. Baranchuk. Um, so we can open up for question. If anybody else has additional questions, you can raise your hand icon or unmute. Uh, while we're waiting to see to warm up the audience for questions, my question is, what's coming next? There's always lots of excitement and new research and discoveries coming out of your lab. What's your team up to? And can you share anything or are you holding it off till the next set of presentations for us? I think I'll let Rachel take this one because uh, she has that paper that's coming out uh, tomorrow and that systematic review that we're still working on right now. Um, yeah, the papers that we presented today, you know, they're kind of hot off the press, you know, not even in the publication uh, realm yet. So um, we do have lots of exciting things in, in, the, in the backlog for us. Um, we are going to be working on a Lyme carditis textbook. Um, so, our, so that should be, uh, we're in the beginning stages of that currently. Um, and we are looking to set up some prospective studies as well, um, looking at patients with ECG abnormalities. Um, and so that's, once again, very much in its infancy, but we've got lots of ideas on how to proceed uh, to further our research on, on the topic of Lyme carditis. Perfect, thank you. And while I'm waiting to see if hands rise, please don't be shy, feel free to ask your questions. One of the, because uh, I get the, the postings that the public health agency um, sends out, I think they're on a quarterly basis. And one of them mentioned their updates to, I guess they had our, put out a survey out to the general public for feedback on Lyme disease and their website and how they can improve it. And one of the things that I saw on there, which I thought was fantastic, is they wrote a need of future things to include information about Lyme carditis. So I'm just wondering, have those synergies started? Have you guys um, started to, you know, help, help with education and awareness, which you have raised as a very important factor? I'm just wondering if that's something that we can see coming out sooner or do conversations still sort of have to happen with that? I think it's something that um, we haven't yet had the opportunity to explore, uh, meaning the educational side of things yet. Um, you know, we're definitely open to getting involved with those conversations. But I think, you know, in general, Lyme carditis, as Nancy uh, mentioned, is uncommon. Um, and, and the focus really does need to be on, you know, preventing Lyme and all of the other complications as well that can occur from a Lyme infection. And so just general education on how um, to prevent tick bites um, and how to manage them if you do uh, receive a tick bite, that's, that's the crucial message that we want to get across. Because if people get treatment early, um, then we can prevent some of these uh, later complications such as the Lyme carditis. So focusing upstream on their messaging, I think would be a good thing. Great. Well, I was really excited to see that they had raised that as one area that needed more information sharing. So that's fantastic. And a tribute to Dr. Baranchek and his research team that he has around him. Um, so again, we do have a few minutes for questions, comments. Don't be shy. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand icon or unmute and ask a question. Just checking to see. We have a quiet audience today. Okay. Well, I'm just gonna switch and share my screen while we're wrapping things up just to give them an update of what's happening tomorrow. 
But while I'm sorting things out and doing a one final check to make sure there's no hands raised, I do want to thank Dr. Wombot and Dr. Wang for their presentation today. Um, it's always enlightening to learn more what's going on in your research lab. And again, I hope to have you back again next year to learn more of what's going on. Um, just to reminder and a few updates for those on the call, some of them I recognize as our regular attendees. Uh, our next session is tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Leona Gilbert is presenting on the topic updates and the pathogenesis of Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, Dr. Uh, Gilbert is a researcher from Finland, so she'll be on the call tomorrow to give her presentation. Unfortunately, our presentation um, had to be canceled for Thursday. Um, our speaker, unfortunately, had some, is not available to attend for personal reasons, um, but we will try to see if we can get her back for a presentation in the future, which I will share that information if you're on our uh, distribution list. Um, and then just a reminder to take part in our challenge, wear green or wear a green face mask, take a photo and share it with us to help spread awareness for Lyme disease. Um, if you don't like to send personal photos in, and but you are artistic or creative, you can send drawings or pieces of art that, that express Lyme Disease Awareness Month, and all entries received will be entered into a draw for one of four $25 uh, Starbucks e-gift cards, and our live draw will occur on our last day of our presentations on May 31st, and you can send your entries to Clyderin at gmail.com. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing for a second. So again, tomorrow we do have one more presentation this week, and then we'll take a break. We have three presentations next week, um, and then the last week we have two presentations. So again, I do thank everybody for attending today. Thank you, Dr. Wombolt, Dr. Wang, for your presentation, and uh, we hope to see you tomorrow if you join us in our series. Um, have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Take Thanks care. So much.